is that something? And in your own words, why are those mountains more blank than the valleys below? Why are those mountains more blank than the valleys below? So last last week I didn't I didn't give the group that this chance to talk about it first. I just went straight after it. So I'm gonna give you guys like 30 seconds, a minute. What are the two things we've covered and why? Alright, take a minute. Wait, the three is wet, windier, and colder, right? Yeah, those are all three. And we did, uh, we definitely did windier. We did windier. Which is the sun series. They are when colder. Atmosphere, the lowest atmosphere. They're windier because of the interior effect. Very rightly so, in my opinion, kind of got on everybody and was like, why are you here? Right? Why are you in Mesa if we're not, if we're not here to, to be a part of this? So, I would encourage you, throw out those answers right throw out those opinions something and i will blame myself for this something i have not done well this year so i don't expect the six kids really know about it but something i've talked about that i'm sure the eighth graders heard of a lot is that i will never like look down at you or think badly of you for a wrong answer i will never like scoff at you or make fun of you or expect you to always have the right answer what i will expect you to do is to give a best guess right so Getting the answer wrong, throwing up a hand and giving an educated idea that's not correct, that's fine, that's great. It shows that you're taking what you know and you're trying to apply that knowledge right to real world context. But not participating, not throwing out that answer, that's when I'll brag it at you someday. Does that make sense? I feel like I, I've done a bad job of expressing that for me, it's not always how much you remember, it's do you know why we're learning this and building the process on it? And I feel like I've done a bad job this year. I'll take the blame for that. Okay. Mountains are what? Mountains are what? Who wants to take that one? Mountains are colder, wetter, and windier. Mountains are colder, wetter, and windier than the valleys below. And we have talked about colder and windier. There's someone here who, in their own words, wants to go with why mountains are colder than the valleys below. Oh, you gotta go big. You gotta go big. Wow. And what is compacting the air? What is what is it that's pushing down, right? Making it warmer. What is that big thing? What do you think? Air pressure. Air pressure, right? Who okay. said? Greater pressure, we stood on an open head and we bumped into each other and we talked about how that greater pressure increases temperature in the valleys below. That was great. That was great. Alright, what about windier? Who wants to take on windier? Why are mountains windier than the valleys below? What do we think? The Venturi effect. The Venturi effect. Yeah, the Venturi effect, right? Remember we talked about how it was like that giant thumb coming down and squeezing, right? Squeezing down on that garden hose and that shoots that water faster, which is a lot like that air getting squeezed in between the trophy paws and the top of the summit, right? That air moves faster. There's another thing we talked about that we're going to revisit today. Um, for why mountains are wetter. So, oh, sorry, you want to Oh, I just something else for windier. Yeah, no, go for it. Go and for that it. That hits the side of the mountain and goes up, so the oh, wind goes faster up the top. Yeah, the so it hits that side of the mountain and it's forced up, right? And that ramps up those air speeds. So, for today, we're gonna have, I'm gonna say two vocab words that we should like pay attention to. One of them we've talked about before, one of them is gonna be new. Because uh, today we're going to talk about how mountains are wetter than the valleys below. So today is May 25th. We are in Hinkham Notch. You could put like, you know, May 25th, Hinkham Notch, uh, w uh, WMNF, the White Mountain National Forest.
think we can do it. I think we can take. I, I know we can do, the, do it. I think we can do the the soil test today. With these guys. There we go. If we have an extra half an hour, I feel like we can do it. Um, we'll just kind of run up there. Then up there. Okay, so May twenty fifth, two thousand twenty one, Pinkham Notch, W N N F, the White Mountain National Forest. Um, the two kind of vocab words we're gonna look at are orographic uplift, which we've talked about before. O R O G R A P H I C orographic uplift. O R O or graph G-R-A-P-H ick I see or graphic up lift and then the other one is adiabatic dew point. Ooh. We talked about adiabatic Wait, we talked about adiabatic lab tree? Yeah we did. We did. We talked about adiabatic lab tree. Now we're gonna talk about Adiabatic dew point. A D I A B A T S E. Adiabatic. A D A D I A B A T I C. Adiabatic dew point. I'd like to think you have adiabatic already in your notebooks, right? Because when you're at Elephant Head, that's when you did adiabatic lapse rate. So here's I'm gonna. I'm gonna pull out some critical thinking skills really quickly. All right? So, we've heard the word adiabatic before. Adiabatic, adiabatic lapse rate refers to how the air changes temperature as you go up in elevation. And now I'm telling you adiabatic dew point. So what do you think the word adiabatic might refer to? What do you think? I know we haven't talked about what the words well, about dew point yet, but you probably know what dew is. What do you think? Just take a guess. What do you think? Change? Like change? Oh, maybe change. That's really good. The different temperatures that you realize is that. Did you have to temperature? Any other guesses? Air. Air. Yeah. Adiabatic refers to air. That's good. But, but you guys, see, even though you weren't quite on it, that's great, because you're using the knowledge that you have to try and formulate a guess and an answer. So that's totally fine, right? Not expecting everyone to know all this stuff. I barely know it. All right. So here's what we're going to do today. We are going to take, today, you don't need to write this part down. We're probably only going to take two measurements to, to look at how mountains are wetter in the valleys below. We're going to take one measurement um, probably across the street at around 2,000 feet. And then we'll take our second measurement on top of square ledge at 2,400 feet. So we're really not going up all that high, so we might not see a real big difference in our measurements. How do you think we might be able to measure? I mean, right, it's not raining. It's like a sunny day. I can't stand out here with like a, a, a rain gauge. It's not going to look any different at 2,000 feet and it's 2,400 feet. How could we possibly measure that it gets wetter as you go up? What could we do? What could we observe or look at? If I can't, you know, if I can't measure the rain, what else could I look at? Oh, the soil! Yes, the soil! What else could I possibly look at other than soil? What do you think? How much moss is there? Plant life, right? If we're looking at like plants, right? And what's growing there? What kind of vegetation is growing around? Great. So here's what we're gonna do. Let's um, grab our bags. I'm gonna need to stop at my car to grab one thing. I didn't grab the soil core. And then we are going to bring in a group of like three. All right, so in a minute, you're gonna find uh, somebody else who's got a soil core, right? Once you have that soil core, have we? I can't remember if we've used soil cores this year or not. I don't think we have. No, um, no, I think we did it. Oh, no. Can I see that real quick? The way that you're gonna sample 
I was in a minute here, and we're not going to do it on the trail, but kind of off the trail, off the trail. What I want you to do is you'll take your soil core, and all you do whoo, is push it down into the ground like this and slowly turn. Uh, you just can go down like, I would say, if you go down three to four inches, that's fine. Right? I can't, I, I got one arm right now, so I can't really go down very far. Once you've done that, yeah, see, I didn't go down far enough. Once, you, once you've gone down far enough, say three to four inches, you're going to take that soil and you're going to do what's called a ball test, which means you're going to take that soil and you're going to try and make a ball out of it. Okay, like in your hand like this, like make a ball out of it. Once you've done that, I'm going to hand each group a sheet that's going to check how much moisture the soil is holding. So you're going to get a sheet that looks like this. And you're just going to pay attention to the bottom chart. And we are going to use this first one on the left, where it says moderate coarse texture. So it looks at soil, and this is kind of confusing, but it looks at soil moisture deficiency, which means not how much it's holding, but how much it's lacking. So if it's at 0%, that means that it is sopping wet. You can squeeze that ball, right? And there's like a wet outline, like there's like a wet outline of that ball on your hand. Okay? If it's at 0 to 25, it forms a weak ball, like you make a ball, but if you were to like throw it up and try and catch it, it would break apart. 25 to 50, it forms that ball, right? But it like, if you were to toss it up, it would like totally smash apart, coming back in your hand. 50 to 75, it does not, like it won't form a ball at all. And at 75 to 100, it just like falls through your fingers. Right, it just, it's like, just like loose, loose soil. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what that means is 75 to 100, it's at 100% deficiency, right? It's, it's lacking all moisture. So we're gonna take one sample here, and then we're gonna take one sample up at square ledge. Are there any questions as to what I'm asking you to do? Does anyone not understand what you're about to do? All right. So we've got five guys here that all have soil cores, three people to a group approximately, and then when you're ready, I'll hand you a sheet. About 50, I think that's about where we're at, about 50% field capacity. So we will test this again. We'll do this one more time right before we get to um, the top of square ledge, right before we walk out of the top of square ledge. We'll do this one more time. Um, what we're gonna do now though, is we're gonna need to do a little bit of walking because we gotta make sure that we are being uh, good with our time. So just hang on to those soil cores. Like I said, just throw them in your backpack or put them somewhere so you have your hands free. Um, just like when we, when we hike all the time, we're gonna have one person who's gonna be a lead. I'm gonna start leading. One person's gonna be asleep. It's gonna be Mr. Oliver. Please stay in between us at all times. You can put away your, uh, your, your journals, clipboards right now. That's fine. Cause we're gonna walk a little ways before we stop again. Uh, this trail was cut, you know, probably hundred years ago, maybe 140 years ago. No, 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 probably 100 years ago. Um, and uh, the reason it's called Ladies Lookout is at the time, uh, mountaineering and, and mountain climbing was considered a, a manly pursuit. And the, the delicate females couldn't, be, you know, they'd, oh, they would not have the constitution to hike such a high mountain. Um, and so what they did is they cut this, this small trail here and they have pictures of, of women in like big, really dresses and like parasols and binoculars coming up here to watch their men hike, right? And what people didn't understand at the time is that it wasn't that women didn't have the strength to hike mountains. The problem was that twofold. One, they weren't allowed to. And two, they had to wear like 70 to 80 pounds of clothing and like super tight corsets and things like that. And so it's like, yeah, if you like tie a bunch of ropes around my ribs, and put 90 pounds of clothes on me, I can't hike anywhere. Um, luckily, we now live in a time that uh, hiking and recreation sports has become somewhat more equal, and so uh, there are tons and tons of amazing 
women, rock climbers, mountaineers, paddlers, hikers, bikers, and uh, are now given more of a fair opportunity. But this time we had this kind of a relic to like keep people in mind that there was a time when, you know, people were oppressed and not allowed to pursue passions that they had. So kind of crazy. So big chunks kind of fall out. And so part of what it picked up were those big chunks of sand, right, or pulverized rock in the sand, as it melted back, you'd have these big sand dumps, these big, this, all this glacial till, right, rocky, rocky stuff and sand dumps. That's why the sand dunes are there. Why are they on the east side? So we're going to get to that, along with why mountains are wider than the valleys below. So we have air that blows in, right? So let's say air is moving in from this, actually, we're going to say the air is moving in this way because most storms in the United States move from west to east across the country. Most storms in the United States move from west to east. So that way is west. So we're going to say that wind came in, right? Air moves in and hits the base of this mountain. Air moves in and hits the base of this mountain, and where does that air need to go? Up. Up. And what you have is you have orographic uplift. And orographic uplift is the movement of air from low to high elevation due to terrain. The movement of air from hydraulic and down arrow, elevation to up arrow, elevation due to terrain. Does everyone know what the word terrain means? The land, right? The land formation, formations on the land. The movement of air from low to high elevation due to terrain. Orographic uplift. I call terrain. T E R R A I N. All right. So. Let's think about this. Air comes in, it hits the base of this mountain, right? It is forced up due to aerographic uplift. What's that? Orographic uplift is the movement of air from low to high elevation due to terrain. The movement of air from low to high elevation due to terrain. So, we're gonna think about this for a second. If air comes in, it hits the base of this mountain, and is forced up, we know that mountains are Windier and colder. colder. So if this air comes up and it's colder up here, what is happening to this air? It's learning what, happens when, what happens when what happens if air rises and cools and condenses? It forms clouds. It forms clouds. So what happens is the air rises and hits its adiabatic dew point. Adiabatic dew point is when the temperature of the air cools, temp air cools, the air becomes saturated with water, temp air cools, air full of water, right? And heat cannot enter or leave. Yep. Uh, so adiabatic uh, dew point is when the air temp cools, becomes saturated with water, because it's cooling, right? It's condensing and cooling, and heat cannot enter or leave. Why do you think heat not entering or leaving is a, is a key point? Because if it keeps getting hotter, those clouds are going to disappear. That was the moisture, the saturation. Yeah, right? So, it hits its adiabatic dew point. Now you've got this air that's forced up. It reaches the cold air, it cools and condenses. Clouds form. It hits its adiabatic dew point. So it's full of water. And then what's going to happen? It's going to rain. It's going to precipitate, right? So it's going to rain and precipitate all over this mountain. So, mountains are wetter than the valleys below because of orographic uplift and reaching its adiabatic dew point. Now, 
Here's another thing to show you. And we're just gonna, I'll just do this as one group. So we say, let's imagine this water bottle is uh, a mass of air. Hits the base, it travels up. It starts to cool and condense. It gets really heavy and it starts to precipitate, right? So it's precipitating, 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 precipitating. And then crests over. So what part of the mountain is getting the most amount of moisture? What part? What do you think? Are you answering or waiting bugs? Waiting bugs. Okay. The top. The top. So the top, right? So if you think about it, it's going to be coldest and heaviest right here. So it starts raining, they're snowing, snowing, raining, snowing, raining, snowing. And then right here, all that moisture gets wrung out. So then what's happening on the other side? What's that? Oh, -ho! yes. And we have the rain shadow effect. So the rain shadow effect occurs because air hits one side of a mountain. It rains, 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 snows, 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 right? All that moisture gets wrung out as it passes the peaks. And then there's no, that makes sense, right? And then as it lowers, it heats back up, right? It's starting to heat back up. And so it can't get the same amount of, of precipitation. So you've got a wet side and a dry side. That's called the rain shadow effect. It's a real thing. So if you were to drive, if I were to start in San Francisco, start driving, I would drive through the redwoods and these big drippy, drippy, you know, mossy trees and it's beautiful. And then I crest and I come down and I'm in the Central Valley, which is like a grass, which is like grasslands where they grow produce. And then I hit the Sierras and I drive up and there are huge trees everywhere and it's nice and lush. And I hit the top and I come down and I'm in Nevada, I'm in a desert because of the rain shadow. Because those storms come from west to east, right? So rain, 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 rain. Sierras, Nevada, desert on the other side. You get to Colorado, rain, 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 rain. Like, you know, really nice. Well, that's super, that's tons of precipitation now, but a wetter side, I used to say the Rockies, the wet, uh, wetter, better side is the west side. Rain, 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 get to the other side, and you're in Kansas, right? Not a whole lot of precipitation there, right? In the heartland. And then you get to the Appalachians and it's rain, 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 rain. And you get to like, you know, the, the Vermont, New Hampshire, and there's tons of, oh, it's so, look at this, look at all these trees, look how lush it is. And then you get to the other side and you see the great deserts of Maine. And there's nothing but saguaro cacti <laughs> and lizards and Gila monsters. Right? Yeah. Right, Maine, Maine. Well, what if Nevada is a desert and Kansas has low precipitation, and the Central Valley of California is a desert, and the rain shadow effect is a real thing. I'm not making it up. What I want you to do is turn to somebody, take 30 seconds. Why isn't there a desert in Maine? Like Maine should be a desert. Based on, right? I mean, why isn't Maine Nevada? Why isn't Maine Arizona? Like why, why is there not a huge desert in Maine? All right, grab somebody, take a minute. Um, so we said, over the course of the last, oh geez, I don't know, uh, five or six weeks, we have said that mountains are colder, wetter, and windier than the valleys below. We talked about mountains being colder, and again, of life trace, right? Talk about the amount of pressure, and how that pressure, different atmospheric pressures, can affect heating and cooling. We talked about mountains being windier. The Bernoulli principle, the Venturi effect, about how those winds will ramp up as they get squeezed between the tropas and the summit of the mountain. Today, mountains are wetter. We're going to get the automatic two point. Look at how those mountains are going to just bring all that moisture out of the clouds and cycle through and create that process going. We talk about the rain shadow effect. And we answered that final question as to why there are sand dunes on the east side of the Saco of Frederick Bay. So, from here, we still have a few things left we're going to do. I am meeting with you three more times before this year is up. 
happen real soon. Great, real soon on Thursday. You will see me again real soon on Thursday. Uh, we will be at Malayak at school. It'll be a short, uh, probably like hour, hour and a half class, so a short one. And we, you know, have you guys and have you in a group. Um, and we're gonna very, very lightly dip our toes into climate and climate change. Um, I know that we spend a really long time on that weather. We're doing that because we live in the mountains. It makes sense. Um, if we had more time, we would give equal amount of opportunity to climate, climate change. But unfortunately, we don't. So, on Thursday, we'll be at Malayagat. We will be going over climate and climate change. Looking a little bit behind the science of climate change. Um, and a little bit at the effects of climate change. That's the kind of idea that we're going to get to. The Thursday after that will be another split class. So, hour, hour and a half. Um, we will either wrap up on climate change or go for um, a short walk slash bike ride somewhere that's going to illustrate some of the points of climate and climate change. And then finally, on the 10th, which is our last, my last day with you, um, we are going to be going for an all-day hike. I guess I'll, is this a surprise? Did I just run a surprise? Uh, some of them now, some don't. No okay. worries, no okay. worries. All right, we're going to be doing an all-day hike on that last Thursday, June 10th. Um, that, that sounds horrible. I don't know what that is, but it sounds terrible. I think they're painting. Oh. They're painting not, lines, I think. Not someone's car screaming to death. <laughs> all right, so on June 10th, we're doing an all-day hike with um, everybody. And getting a chance to go out and, and then on that all day hike, it's going to be kind of twofold. It's going to be a celebration of a great year in Mesa. It's going to be a celebration of a great three years for the eighth graders. And it's also going to be focusing a little bit on land use, land management, and forests. Because that is going to be our unit for the next year and everybody else. And when we jump into it, just a, you know, after a quick summer break. Yes. Oh, where is it? Can I tell them where we're going? Ma yeah. Okay. Yeah, Hedgehog. So, Hedgehog Mountain oh, is you're familiar with the Kank. You know the Kank Mangus Highway? Yeah, so, yeah, we go down the Kank a ways and, yeah, it's, it's a nice hike. It's a beautiful hike, Hedgehog Mountain. You get really lovely views of the Sandwich Range, uh, Albany Intervale. It's got some, uh, a couple of, like, fun parts that are glades and glades you can kind of scramble up a little bit. It's super fun. Um, and we'll be will be a great day. Hope we get a good day just like this. Um, so that is our plan with Tidmount at least for the for the rest of the time that we have. All right, here's what I want to do to wrap things up today. Is uh, I gotta do this real quick. Almost out of time here. Is I just want to do a quick one word whip. You gotta be loud. So if you take today, this morning, and you had to summarize it or boil it down to one word. I'll give you that one word you would use to describe your day today. It be any word you want, as long as it makes sense to you. So one word whip. However you want to summarize, whether you want it to be an academic word, whether you want it to be about the hike, whether you want it to be about some joke someone told you halfway through the day, whatever it is. One word that you think summarizes you are dead. You're morning this morning at a pick a match. Once you got it, it's a one word whip. We're going to go around. Everyone's just going to say that one word. Are you ready to start us off? Sure. All right, we're going to start here. And All right, we're going to start this way. We'll go around like this. So in Wisconsin.